There are approximately 6.8 billion people in the world today, of which 10% are reborn Christians. This is an average of one reborn Christian for every nine non-believers. It is further estimated that approximately 150,000 people die daily, of which only 10% are saved. This means 135,000 people are streaming into hell on a daily basis. Two people every second of every day. My brothers and sisters, especially those in ministry, but it goes for everyone on the face of this earth. It goes for everyone on the face of the earth. There's a reason why we are alive. There is a purpose behind our existence. God made no mistake. He called you into ministry. And there's a reason for that calling. And the fact that you are here this morning. And that you are alive. Means that God is not finished with you yet. And that the best is yet to come. It doesn't matter how old you are. I was in Australia a couple of years ago with Pastor Jonah. I joined him at the conference of the generals. And there was an older pastor. And they asked me to come pray for the pastors. And when I got to this pastor, I said, God is not finished with you yet. He's still going to use you mightily. And that pastor couldn't believe in what I'm telling him. Because from his perspective, he was already old. If you are here, you're listening to my word this morning. I see no old people except Pastor Jonah. <laughs> God is not finished with you yet. There is a calling on all our lives. But to follow Jesus takes faith. And it's written in the book of Hebrew chapter 11 verse 6. But, with, but without faith it's impossible to please and follow uh, and, and to, impossible to please and be satisfactory to him. For whoever would come near to God must believe that God exists and that He is a rewarder of those who earnestly and diligently seek Him. A calling usually starts with a burden. A calling usually starts with something that happens in your heart that you cannot leave. Can you remember Moses? When Moses saw that, 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 he, that, he, that, uh, that Egyptian hitting the Hebrew guy, he said, I couldn't stand it. And he killed that man. God was burdening a vision in him. A calling. Do you remember yesterday Nehemiah? 
when that person came back and said the, 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 the wall in Jerusalem was lying in ruins. Something happened in the heart of Nehemiah. And he knew that he had to pursue that vision. You see, if there's a vision that comes from God, it will become a moral imperative. And you will know if you don't pursue that vision, you will be disobedient. You will just know that you cannot leave that. You see, a vision usually consists out of three components. A vision is usually about a problem. And it's about the solution. And then a reason why you must pursue that vision. I want you to go to the book of Nehemiah. If we go to Nehemiah chapter 2, and that's not in the New Testament, that's in the Old Testament. And we read verse 17 and 18. It reads as follows. Then I said to them, You see the trouble that we are in. Jerusalem lies in ruins. And its gates have been burned with fire. So that was the problem. Nima Nehemiah said, look, there's the problem. Jerusalem doesn't have a wall around it. Everybody's coming into Jerusalem, all the thugs and all the thieves. Jerusalem is unprotected. And then he gave the solution. He said, come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem. That was the solution to the problem. And then he says, the reason why. He says, and we will no longer be in disgrace. Problem, solution, and reason. Think of your vision. You must be able to make sense of your vision. From my perspective, I am an evangelist. So the calling that God has given me, I could say people are going to hell. I must go tell them about Jesus. Because Jesus saves. Because if I don't do that, they will be lost forever. What is the vision that God has put in your heart? What is the problem? What is the reason why you should pursue it? And what is the solution? Let's say you want to build a church. You will say, but, you know, we have a problem. There is no place for us where we can come together when it rains. We can't be under the tree. We must build a building. That is the solution. Because if we don't build that building, people are not going to come. Especially when it rains. Problem, solution, and reason. The vision that God has given us in ministry is not our vision. 
It's God's vision. We are all called in ministry because we are here to fulfill God's vision. You know when a leader casts a vision and he does it successfully, then people will see what the leader sees. Then everybody behind the leader comes and buy into the vision. And they all work together towards realizing the vision. It's not my vision. It's God's vision. It's my, it's my purpose on this earth to fulfill God's vision on this earth. We are not building our own kingdoms. We are not supposed to compete. Churches are not supposed to compete. We are all behind God's vision. Therefore, the message of the verse that I read said, You must humble yourself. We must all humble ourselves below the vision of God. And God resists the pride, the, the proud. Those people who think they can do it themselves. And I'm sorry to say that, but it happens. Sometimes you can even give PK people who say, pay me a thousand and I will pray for you. Pay me a thousand and I'll pray for you. Pay me some money and I'll pray for you. Give, me to, give some money to my ministry and God will do a miracle for you. Be careful. I'm not saying that you're not entitled to make a living. But you didn't die on the cross. Jesus did. Jesus paid the price. We are here to promote His gospel. It is His kingdom. It is His glory. It is His word that we are called to proclaim. It does get better. Pastors just wait. The message does get better. <laughs> Hallelujah. If we want to accomplish the vision which is the Great Commission, we must clothe ourselves with humility for God resists the proud and especially those who think that they can go through life themselves without God. In humility, we base our calculations on God's ability. In humility, we walk by faith. And we are not ruled by our senses or our own knowledge to realistically live in this manner. To really live like this. We must cast all our cares on him. Not some of our cares. Not some. We don't say, but I will, I will cast this problem on you, Lord, but this one I'll solve myself. Eh? What do we do when there's a problem? We first try and solve the problem ourselves. We find that that doesn't work. Then we want to go to God. First we go to God. Remember that if you're in ministry, you're pursuing God's vision. And God will provide. 
Uh-uh. God will provide. I want you to hear me. I want you to hear me because it's the message of this morning. You see, sometimes we've got so much cares. So much things that we are worried about. But cares becomes weight. The more worries you have about the provision that you need, the heavier it becomes. Later on you walk like this. Because you don't know the answer to your problems. Because you are not trusting God. You remember the message of yesterday? Momentum. It is when we start listening to the devil. I want to say this again. Cares become weight. To make it easy, your worries becomes weight. The more you worry, the more difficult it becomes to fulfill your God calling. Because you are looking at the rubbish. Let's take the Israelites. They are standing at the river Jordan. It took them one year. I want you to hear me. It took them one year to move from Egypt to the river Jordan. Here they are standing. God promised them the promised land. They are standing at the river. They are looking across the river. They can see the vision that God gave them. But they need to cross the river. Do you need to cross the river? Amen. Do you need to cross the river? Amen. Where are you finding yourself this morning? Are you finding yourself standing on this side of the river Jordan just looking at the promise? But notwithstanding the fact that God promised them. What did God promise you? What is the vision that lives in your heart? They decided to send 12 spies to go check out the promised land. I think they packed themselves some food. They gathered all the things that they need. And there they went up into the promised land. They spent some time there. Then they came back. And they came back with the following report. Ten of them said, It is a promised land. All twelve of them said, It is a promised land. Wow! You can't believe, Pastor Jonah. You can't believe the grapes are as big as soccer balls. It is the land of milk and honey. It is our destiny. Oh, I know that this is what is meant for us. But then they said, but there's a problem. Those people, oh, they're big. They are powerful. They've got these big cities and they've got walls around their cities. We will never be able to to defeat those people. Ten of them said it will never happen. And then they started murmuring. And they said, did God bring us all this way for our wives and our children to die? 
when we go into the promised land to battle, they had cares. They saw the promised land. But they said, our children and our wives will die when we go there. Only two said, but God promised. But God promised that land belongs to us. If God said it, so shall it be. Only uh, uh, Joshua and Caleb, they stood on the word of God. What did God promise you? What is the vision that God gave you? Are you standing at the river Jordan just looking at the promised land? Are you also thinking this morning of all the things that you have to pay? All the bills you have to pay. God called you to do something miraculously. But you say, but what about my children? They must go to university. What shall we eat? What shall we drink? How is this going to happen? I can see the promise. But God, I don't understand how it will happen. You don't need to understand. You just need to have faith. You just need to have faith. And God rewards those who have faith. Who have faith. You say it's unable. You are unable to. Those spies say they are unable to. If God gave you a vision, you are unable to. If God gave you a vision, it would be so big, you will be unable to. But God is able. God is able. You may say, but I cannot see how it can happen. A God vision is always bigger than you. I said yesterday you will not be able to tell somebody about it because you think they will think you crazy. It was the case with Nehemiah. Yesterday I said Nehemiah cast a vision and everybody came to rebuild the wall. The people who were busy yeah, the people who were busy building the wall, they were farmers. What did they know about building a wall? They had no skill and no training. Tobias came and he said, if a fox leans against the wall, it will fall over. God uses the most unlikely to do the most miraculous things. I am one of those most unlikely people. I'm talking from experience. God could have used 20 better qualified people than I. But God saw my availability. Make yourself available. And God will empower you. And He will do the most miraculous things through you. The ten spies went back. And they told the rest of the Israelites. We will not be able to. Those people are too big. Those people are too strong. They went back to the desert for another 39 years. 40 years it took them before they could enter the promised land. And they all died. Except for Joshua and Caleb who went into the promised land. Who is telling you what? Who is telling you what about your vision? If God said it, you can take it to the bank. God will finish what he has started. 
and God will do what you cannot. It is time to cross the river Jordan. Pastors, it's time to cross the river Jordan. COVID has stolen enough. COVID has stolen enough. There is a new promised land awaiting us. And we must cross that river now. And take possession of the promised land. Oh, but I often hear people say, I don't have money. I know God has got a vision for me. I know God has got greatness in store for me. But I need to have money. Who needs money? Ah, you are afraid to raise your hands. Eh? But Father, if you give me money, I can pursue my vision. I want you to hear me clearly this morning. Vision does not follow money. Money follows vision. I want you to hear me. My brother, you must hear me. Money follows vision. Let me give you an example. If I want to start a business, must I first have the money? Yes, I must have the money. Ah, yes, I must have money to start the business. But if I don't have money, where do I go? I go to the bank and I sell them my vision. And when they can see you have done your homework, when they can see what you see, they make the money available. If you can make other people see what you see, if you can successfully cast your vision and make people believe in what you believe, they will give you money. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Maybe the this program today and you know that the Holy Spirit is convicting you that it's time for you to repent. Time for you to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. If that is your conviction, I would like you to say this prayer after me. Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I repent today and ask that you forgive me. Wash away all my sin. I believe that Jesus is the Son of God and I believe that he is alive. Save me now in Jesus' name. Amen. If you just prayed that prayer, the Bible says, according to John 1.12, you are now the child of God. Congratulations. Do something new in my life. Something new in my life. Something new in my life. Oh Lord, do something new. Something new in my life, oh Lord, do something new in my life, something new in my life, something new in my life, oh Lord, do something new in my life, something new. Spirit in my life cannot do something new. 